Okay, let us officially start. Good morning for the fifth time to those that joined. We are very happy to see so many participants in this meeting. Uh, the, it's a meeting about sharing the XML format of the easy access rules. The purpose of this meeting is to share as much, as, uh, as much information about this format, also about the eRules project with you, so that you understand the philosophy. But most of all, the purpose is to be able to assist you in case you have any technical difficulties, to really check where we're going with that format and what else can we do. So we are there for you. Some uh, organizational uh, information before we start. The session is being recorded. The recording uh, together with the presentation will be shared via the event site. Uh, we still uh, we have a slide uh, showing you how to follow up on that event to receive any any news any new uploads. Mm, the slide will be included in in the presentation. Uh, so uh, a short uh, introduction of the participants that are here with me in the room. We have Marius and Boris, our IT colleagues that uh, took part in the development of uh, that XML format. Online, we have the leader of the development team, Stefan. We also have Yannick with us, who is responsible for the website and uh, online publication, and Tom, our technical support. So a quick look at the agenda. First, we start with a, a super quick uh, overview of the eRules project to, uh, to, to, uh, to tell you how we started. Then we will talk about how the data is structured within the eRules project. And then we will move to a more technical part. We will explain why we went for this XML format and we will give you some uh, ideas on how can it be used. Then we will go through some uh, questions that were frequently asked already, already last year when we shared the, the format with the stakeholders. And then the last bit will be an open session for the questions that you may be asking spontaneously. Uh, so quickly about the eRules project. So how it all started. Uh, it all started, uh, this whole initiative started with uh, recurring questions coming from the stakeholders that can be summarized as, where is my rule? It's due to the fact that the aviation uh, regulation system is a bit complex. So on the left hand side, we have the implementing rule, the hard law, our shell, what you shall do. And this is produced by the European Commission and is published in a PDF format on the, uh, on the Commission site in the official journal. And whenever there is an amendment, by default, you do not have a consolidated version, but you will have an additional regulation saying from now on the paragraph uh, so and so reads in the following way. So on the left hand side, you would need to already start consolidating all the amendments to see what the hard law looks like. On the right hand side, though, we have the acceptable means of compliance and guidance material produced by EASA. And that is a complementary material, complementary regula regulatory material to the implementing rules. And the amendments work exactly the same way. Whenever there is an amendment, there is a bit saying from now on the paragraph reads so and so. So actually what was needed was the two types of consolidation. First of all, to consolidate all the amendments to, to understand, okay, so what is the final uh, what is the final regulation? How does it look like? What am I compliant with? And then to put this bit, uh, uh, those bits together, the implementing rule next to the related AMCGM. So that's precisely what we try to do uh, within the eRules project. So uh, the first thing was we created a platform based on the component content management system. And we took those PDFs scattered on different websites and we migrated them uh, into that platform. And out of that platform, the eRules platform, we started producing the consolidated law, the easy access rules. But I guess that the main change that this project brought was that we turned something that used to be just a piece of text on the website, we turned it into data. 
and we structured it the way that the stakeholders communicated to us that they wanted to see it. That is the implementing rule bit, the implementing rule paragraph was put next to the related AMCGM, next to the related acceptable means of compliance and guidance material. So that was the one, one type of consolidation. The second one was that all the amendments were put on top of it. So we always present the currently applicable law. And then, uh, Stefan, over to you, uh, more about the, the information structure inside the eRules platform. Yes, as uh, Anna was saying, uh, this was built uh, on a component content management solution. And a key item here is the fact that content is divided into components. In this case, the components are actually named topics. But what is a topic? What, what is this unit of information? And allow us to use a Lego analogy to show you this. If you imagine the Lego bricks on the right side of this uh, small uh, illustration, the Lego brick is a topic. And one thing the Lego bricks are really good at is you can combine uh, brick with bricks uh, to build something useful. Um, so the topics in the e-rule systems can be combined into a meaningful publication uh, using a structure like it, the illustration on the lower left side, what we call a map structure. It looks like a table of content. And that's the way we put together these Lego blocks, these modules of content, these topics, into a complete publication. But uh, Anna, back to you so you can show what the the Lego blocks actually look like in real life. Yes, translating this Lego analogy into the rulemaking world. So for us, the first question when we started migrating those PDFs uh, from different websites into the eRules platform, the first question was, OK, so what should be the size of a Lego block? What would be? Sh how should we slice the regulations? At, and at the end, we came to the conclusion that the best size of a Lego brick is one rule paragraph. So we slice the regulations into rule paragraph, one IR, one CS, one AMC. It's for us one block. And coming back to this slide, slide, uh, we slice it into one rule paragraph, and then we assembled it together per aviation domain to create the easy access rules per domain that were uh, where we combine different types of law together. That is the implementing rule topic is next to the related AMC GM topic. And originally you would need to open many different PDFs on different websites to, to be able to do it. So once we sliced the regulatory content into topics, that is into rule paragraphs, uh, the important thing is also to remember that there is a set of metadata attached to each and every topic, a set of metadata that describes it, each and every topic, uh, in a sense that uh, which regulation introduced it, what is the applicability date, what is the entry into force date. And on our website, where the uh, XML documentation is, we clearly stated which set of metadata is regularly updated. Uh, for instance, the, the regulatory source, which regulation or uh, or decision introduced, it, it's it's regularly updated. But some metadata, a, a bit on, more on the technical side, what is the aircraft category, it is not updated with each and every amendment. It's all described in the documentation available on the website. Um, and now translating this into the XML files. Stefan, back to you. Yes, so uh, now uh, Anna showed you what it looks like in when you read it in a PDF file, for example, a topic. But here's what the topic would look like in the export XML. As you can see, there is some tagging with certain metadata, for example, and an uh, ID value with uh, many digits. And then there is a content part of, of this uh, topic. 
And the content part is organized into a number of uh, paragraphs and each paragraph uh, then contain the actual text of the topic. So uh, overall, that's how the topic that you see on the left side would look like in the uh, XML side, on the XML export side. So next slide, please, Anna. So uh, we talked about the topic and we talked about these topic components being combined into a map. And uh, the map would actually look like in Word or in PDF format, it would look like uh, what you see illustrated on the table of content on the left side of the screen. So you can see we've got emergency exits with uh, with a number of uh, subtopics or emergency exit markings with a number of subtopics, as Anna was talking about, the uh, GMs and AMCs uh, for this particular IR. We'll get back to that, by the way. And on the uh, right side, you see how this structure is actually persisted in the export XML format, how it's represented in the export format. Uh, so you can see that there are TOC, table of content, uh, container elements that indicate this tree structure that you see on the uh, left side is represented in here as a tree structure as well uh, in the same way. And next slide, please. Now, uh, Anna already told you about this, uh, that for each topic, there was a set of metadata. And actually, the metadata are just as important uh, information content as the uh, topic itself. Because, first of all, because it'll help you use the topics in many different applications and when automating processes the metadata can be a huge help for you so the topic on the right side here is connected to a label shown like this uh, with the metadata fields and values and what you just saw was the actual linking between the topic and the metadata for this topic happens through this SDT ID field. So you can always find the uh, the metadata that goes with a topic by using this SDT ID field, this value, 16, 89, etc. And then you can find the metadata that are connected to this uh, topic. Another thing that I would like to point out already now is that the uh, eRules ID field is an important field because this field will remain the same from version to version to version of the rule topic. So no matter what changes occur in the text, the eRules ID will always be the same. And as we'll get back to, that's important if you want to do uh, impact analysis on rule changes, et cetera. And uh, having said that, back to Anna. Yes, and uh, back to the philosophy of the eRules project. So once we slice the data into topics, into rule paragraphs, we then assemble them into maps, that is into easy access rules per domain. So we have an easy access rule for each and every aviation domain for ATM, part 21, part 26. We started then sharing the outputs uh, with the stakeholders, sharing the outputs as easy access rules. And our first format uh, coming from the, the eRules platform uh, were easy access rules in the PDF format. So we already shared each and every book uh, with the stakeholders. Everything is available on the ASA website. And then uh, starting from 2020, we started sharing the same content in a different format as an online publication, as basically as a website that adjusts, uh, adjusts more to the mobile views, has some filters. 
And then starting from last year, and that's precisely why we're having this session now, we started sharing the same content in the machine readable format, the XML format. So this information can be important for you in case you want to, for instance, verify the content of the XML format against the human readable PDF or the human readable online publication. And now where to find uh, all those books, the easy access rules. So you enter the uh, ASA website, then there is a main ribbon regulations. Uh, the regulations page is structured into domains. You choose a domain of your interest and under or next to the domain of your interest, there is always a ribbon easy access rules. Once you click on it, you will find those publications in the free available format next to the related domain. Uh, and now okay. let's move to, uh, to do a bit more technical part, the choice of the XML format and what can be done with it. Stefan, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Well, let's, uh, let's have a look at the format uh, that is the export format and why this format was chosen uh, for the export. So we could have, this slide just illustrates the fact that we could have used many different formats. Uh, we could have exported it in uh, in a SQL database format. We could have made it available as a web service to, to users. We could have exported in JSON format. But why didn't we pick anyone anything else? Why did we choose the format that was actually chosen? Uh, it's our hope that explaining this can also explain a little bit about how it can be used. So let's move on to the next slide, please. So XML was chosen as the format and not only XML, but the XML standard, the ECMA 376 ISO IEC 29500 Office Open XML standard. Uh, in, in other words, some of you will know, this is actually the Microsoft Word, as well as Excel and PowerPoint, uh, XML standard behind uh, Microsoft Office that is documented by this public standard. Uh, the reason is to be found in the requirements that we put up when we started defining this export format. The foremost, requirement to the export was that we could support as many different stakeholder use cases as at all possible from the simplest possible use case to the most complex use case and the second very important uh, requirement was that the export format must be uh, high fidelity in other terms that it must be completely, you could also say that it's completely round tripping capable. There is no loss of information involved in the export of uh, the e-rules content, neither in the formatting nor in the modular structure. And now some of you will immediately ask, why on earth is the formatting important? Well, actually, at the moment, formatting in some cases actually carry information. This is something we can talk about later, maybe, or in another session. So that's why formatting can be important in some situations. But at any rate, high fidelity was a very important requirement. It must then uh, some maybe minor requirements that it must support validation. So you can sort of check that it's the, the, the data structure in the export XML is valid. It must be self-contained for practical reasons. So one file can encapsulate all the avail all the needed embedded objects that are used in the e-rule uh, graphics, videos, whatever is used. I, I don't think videos are used anywhere, but anyway, any objects, formulas, graphics, etc are actually contained in the export file. It must be editable, human readable. Maybe that's not the most important thing, but it's more important that it's a machine readable format. So you can actually automate processes that use the 
input the uh, XML export as input. It's an international standard, so it's not something that is, well, it's something that a lot of developers will know more or less to a certain extent. It's fully documented, so there's a huge amount of documentation of this format. Both of the standards uh, Office Open XML format, but also then on the special EASA uh, e rules parts of the XML export that are embedded validly, by the way, in a, in a uh, valid way into the Open XML is uh, documented by both the documentation that accompanies the XML and by an XML schema that uh, can be used to validate this. And uh, finally, there's a rich set of tools, interfaces of all kinds that can be used to uh, process, work on, edit, uh, import, etc., modify, transform uh, the export XML so it matches your precise requirements. So let's move on. Next slide, please, Anna. This is a small example just to, to show you the, the uh, what, how uh, the export XML can be used. This is an example of how the export XML can be transformed using an XSLT style sheet uh, into, for example, a JSON format. JSON is uh, JavaScript object notation, very popular. Uh, among uh, JavaScript developers because it's immediately easy to use in mobile applications, web applications, etc. And this shows how it's easy to, uh, pardon the expression, dumb down the content. Simplify is a better term. How it's how it's easy to simplify the content. You can never, you know, let's say we had chosen to export in a simpler format, it would be obviously logically impossible to add for further detail. Uh, so that's why it's important that you start out with the maximum amount of detail because it's easy to simplify from that base into uh, the level of detail, the level of formatting information, etc., that you need. And here, one of the things you can see here is that there is no formatting uh that remains in this example so that's been shaved away uh, leaving the text itself uh, in its naked form uh, so you you are now free to format it the way you need for your web application that was one example let's move on Anna please next slide uh talking about editors and other tools well any XML or text editor or coding tool as long as it can handle large files uh, is uh, is useful can be useful working with the xml format but you can also open as i think uh, it was already mentioned you can also open it uh, using uh, microsoft word to uh, view and to validate the information in uh, microsoft word format now there are things that you won't be able to see when you open it in Word, and that's an important thing. What you won't be able to see when you open it in Word are the metadata. So they're in there, but they're not immediately visible in the Microsoft Word interface. You have to look and deeper in the XML to see those. Other tools and standards, uh, just there is a huge number of standards and tools that you can uh, use no matter what development environment uh, you use, whether you use an SQL uh, database environment or uh, other types of environment, JavaScript and web environments, etc., all of these environments have some kind of interface that's available to work on the XML uh, export format, or you can use the XSLT transformation to fine tune the content to your environment. Next slide, please. So how can it be used? As we stated, we at least had the objective 
And I think we've the objective is uh, indeed uh, we have we have met the objective as far as uh, we know. You can make us smarter and wiser on that, but from simple to complex use cases. And uh, we've listed a few uh, use cases uh, here as we imagine them. Uh, and some of them are, are use cases that we know of uh, in advance. But uh, obviously, uh, it would be very interesting in the Q&A session maybe to get more information about your use case and if we are missing anything. But from the simple, uh, simplest possible use case where you actually open up uh, the eRuleX port and you add your proprietary content, your proprietary formatting, and you print the whole thing. Uh, basically, you can do this using Microsoft Word and save it in Word document format and format and print uh, as much as you want. And that's probably the uh, simplest possible use case. Other use cases uh, could involve importing maybe transforming uh, before importing into, for example, an existing regulatory application. If you have, uh, are using, if you're using an, uh, a regulatory application for your certification management, et cetera, then perhaps through uh, a transformation, it would be possible to import the content directly into your regulatory application. You can import it into knowledge portals, import it into existing CCMS solutions, if anyone are using that, existing databases, etc. And and below the, the one of the examples, it's a more detailed example, but it's an example that uh, I know some people find very useful. Whenever a rule changes, and we'll get back to that in detail. Uh, you can do an impact analysis on the rule change so you know exactly what are your proprietary materials that are actually linked to the uh, e-rule change uh, that is now uh, changed so you can you know how to change your training materials your uh, standard operating procedure documentation etc cetera, etc cetera. okay Let's uh, have a look at uh, cl a little closer look at some of the examples by going to the next slide. This is the uh, simplest possible way of, of uh, using the uh, e rules export XML. Open it in Word, add your own uh, proprietary content. This would be the 243 emergency exit content. Uh, and then you could either decide to keep as a reference the uh, EASA E rule, or you could uh, filter it out when printing for your users and only have it available for your authors, editors, approvals. So they could always see what's the actual wording when they uh, when they come up with a possible proprietary. Uh, operating procedure to follow this uh, rule. So that's the simplest possible. Let's move on and have a look at another possible application where you, uh, through a transformation probably, you turn the uh, e-rule topic into an SQL database uh, record. So here you can see we've got all the various uh, metadata fields, and then at the end, uh, as is quite common among in when you store content in an in an SQL database, you have the actual content of the E rule as a uh, maybe a large binary object called a blob uh, at the bottom of this. So there's a lot there's the last field contains act the actual text and content of the rule and the other fields are normal database text fields with various values, text or date fields, 
uh, with the various uh, metadata values. Next slide, please. This this slide is then a, a slightly more uh, you know expanded version of the last one, where you have on the one side you have an authoring environment that makes it possible to author proprietary content, proprietary operating procedures, processes, etc., work uh, items uh, or work instructions, and uh, along with the EASA content that is related to this uh, operating rule, you know, so you could have possibly, you could have many rules with many operating procedures that did not have a direct relationship to EASA e-rules export. But then again, uh, here the important ones are, or the important thing is that some of your operating procedures might be directly linked to EASA content. And this would help you when you have to figure out the impact of changing rules, where do you need to change that? So this is into a imagined uh, CCMS system here shown as an SQL database, more or less. And this could then be used to drive your portals to your mobile applications, etc., or to your printed manuals and PDF manuals, etc. So that's probably the more, uh, the more, what should we say, uh, complex uh, use case that uh, some of you probably work with something that looks like this, but uh, we these are only illustrations, of course. So let's move on. Having uh, gone through the the format and uh, how we imagine you can use the format. Let's move to the next main topic of today's presentation, and that would be uh, question and answers. And we want to start out with some of the previously received uh, questions and the answers that we have been filling in here. And if you look at this, uh, this link, to the as a website, uh, you get to the easy access rules uh, export XML, and you can get obviously you can get the actual XML using the link uh, the link bar on top, or you can uh, have a look at the uh, frequently asked questions, uh, the FAQs, and we are going to be expanding on on these. Uh, FAQs as we receive your questions and we come up with them. For this session, we have chosen just a couple to go into a little detail with the uh, response that we have given. So let's have a look at this one. When an amended version of a rule is published in XML format, is there a way to determine what are the changes compared to a previous version? And obviously, the answer is yes, there is a way, and uh, it can be done programmatically. It's possible to automate this uh, completely by basically comparing two XML files, two or the two topics, XML files, and extracting the changes. And here's, a, here's an important information on how this can be done. The e-rules ID, this unique identifier of a particular topic, uh, when you match this with the regulatory source metadata field, uh, then the rule is if the if you have an e-rules ID that is also present in the next publication and the regulatory source has a different value in this publication than in the previous or in this release from the previous release, then you have a changed topic. And I'm trying to illustrate that further in the next slide, please, Anna, where you can actually see the, the fields that we are talking about here, the e-rules ID field and the regulatory source field. So whenever you have uh, an item that has the same e-rules ID as previously, but a different regulatory source ID, 
then you know for sure with certainty that you have a changed topic and then you can start your process or your analysis on where does this impact your materials if needed. Yes, and if I could complement here a bit, so the regulatory source value will only be different in case uh, in case this uh, particular topic is amended. For the topics that were not amended and there is a new release of an XML file, it will the value will stay the same. Uh, and here maybe Stefan, before you start the technical explanation, uh, uh, maybe a business intro. So in this project, like we said at the beginning, we are combining different types of law, the hard law and the soft law. And because we are putting these uh, topics together, uh, it represents uh, how, how we combine it. It resembles then uh, a tree structure. And as you can see, the uh, paragraphs coming from uh, the implementing rule or from certification specifications, they will be treated as a, it represents basically a parent-child structure. The, the uh, hard law will be representing a parent and the related AMCGM will be representing the, the, the child relationship. And there were many questions on how to identify that relationship in the XML files. Stefan, over to you. Yes, and here you see basically the same uh, content that Anna was uh, showing on the uh, left side of the screen, now in the uh, XML format. Now, first of all, remember that, uh, as mentioned before, the SDT ID is the link to the actual text. So for each of these topics, the SDT ID will point you directly to the actual topic text in the in this uh, xml file but two things um, for each uh, topic you will see that or sorry for for the topics here you will see that they are organized in a tree-like structure just as illustrated on the left side so you can see there is a toc a table of content container uh, uh, element that is used to organize the child topics underneath the parent topic, uh, just as in the uh, in the tree structure on the left. So that's one way you can figure out the parent child relationship by just looking at the tree structure. However, uh, a more robust way of doing this is by looking at the for the uh, child topics you'll be able to see that there's a reference to a parent IR topic uh, and the reference is to the uh, title of the uh, parent IR. Now, both of these, what should we say, uh, these ways of encoding the structure and the relationship uh, can be found automatically or programmatically uh, with an application so you can test for these things and you can find it um, so you can automate uh, and use this uh, relationship in automated processing of the content. And I think that was, uh, that was uh, as far as I go, that was the explanation of this, but I've noted, Anna, as you have probably as well, that we have received many, many questions. So it's time to move uh, to that part of the session, I think. Yes, we received many, many questions. Thank you very much for that. We uh, appreciate it. I see there are some technical questions. There are some questions on uh, on the legal side of the project. There are some questions about the rulemaking side of the project. Let's try to take mm -hmm. it. Uh, so. We have time till 12. We will be trying to answer those questions, I guess, coming from the top to bottom. The questions that will remain unanswered uh, will be answered via the uh, FAQs. And uh, we also invite you, it's the first session of this type. Uh, we are very happy that this session uh, brought so many participants. 
So it means there is really a, a big interest. So uh, please follow the event page to be informed about the next session that uh, we plan to organize in about one month. And the questions that would require a bit more live interaction with the stakeholders will be also answered then. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think it, it's fair to say we, we plan to answer all the questions. We right? plan to answer all yeah. the questions. So it's yes. not, uh, mm -hmm. don't, don't worry. Uh, if we miss something, then uh, don't we'll hesitate to. We definitely to... miss something because in this limited time frame. No, no, no I, I mean, I mean, because uh, what, I'm, what I'm saying is we, we, we answer has how many uh, is possible now. The, the ones which on will, will be remaining, we'll be answering them as well. Mm -hmm. When we meet again, if we if we, for some reason, we, we missed anything. So and and uh, whoever asked that question wants to 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 have an answer and will participate. Then then we'll do we'll do our best to to, to, to accommodate. So, uh, but we, we plan to to answer all. Of yes. Them. Okay. So and it's just so many, it's so many interesting. Okay. And actually, um, I was uh, frankly, I was I was scanning the the list of questions. I was uh, thinking that if we could if we could pick some, but I'm I'm afraid that I'm 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 not I'm not able to just just pick one and maybe we we just answer when them in, in in the order in which they were. Uh, That's what I asked. think. Yes. Yeah? Let's let's go from yeah. the So. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, um, right in the beginning. The top. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, do a bit of uh, reading for the questions and uh, yes. asking my colleagues uh, um, Stefan and Anna to, to, to clarify. I'll try to do my best to, to, to answer uh, based on my knowledge. Um, Stefan, uh, don't hesitate. Interrupt me, and if you want to, to, to say something, that just don't, uh, don't hesitate, Anna. As so, well. Um, right. So we have a um, right in the beginning when uh, when uh, uh, Stefan was talking about um, um, the um, the e rules ID and the SDT ID. Um, we, we have a comment uh, that uh, when uh, Stefan mentioned about the e rules ID as being a uh, um, a value which doesn't change, which which remains stable for a certain topic across several publications regulations. You know, so when, and um, um, we have a comment about that it's a very, very important message. Stable ID is key to handle updates in data in database. We recognize that from the from the beginning, and uh, we uh, we we introduced it. And indeed, Eros ID is um, 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 uh, is 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 for is intended for this use. Um, and we we had um, uh, another thing which and I wanted to connect to this question about SDT ID and Eros ID and how they compete with each other. That was the question which came a bit later in slide 25, and and it is a good point to make. So SDT ID um, is just I don't know maybe uh, maybe you could just, just jump to the to the slide uh, Anna any slide which shows the SDT ID I think it's better just go better if you look at look at it. Um, So um, any yeah. any one which any slide which shows it, um, I think or the one that um, um, shows uh, right right oh, no the the one in the beginning with um, uh, which shows the connection between SDT ID and um, connecting the metadata to the uh, topic source. So just write um, more 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 more. Yeah here yeah so slide, if you slide ten yeah. So if you if you look here the SDT ID you see that it's it's the way to connect um, the part of the XML uh, in the same file which describes the metadata for a topic to the actual uh, topic the actual uh, topic content and and this is we, we use this mechanism because we're using our XML format and the, the way we we inserted our uh, own um, description of the metadata there. It, it complies with XML format with different packages. I won't go now into details. But um, what is important here? The SDT ID is just a pointer inside the file. You know, it's not it's not expected to be. It's not going to have the same value, or it's not guaranteed to have the same value across several publications. So it's just the, the validity is just inside the inside the certain file, and just allows you when you parsing the file, allows you to 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 um, when you look at the at, at the topic tree or uh, the uh, the table of content tree, which has the the the, the metadata, you can then use this SDT ID to connect. To other parts of the uh, of the XML tree and find the content of the topic. So it's it's yeah, just can I, uh, the point. Yeah. 
Um, it doesn't have I'd like to, to not yeah, in I'd like to, yeah, sorry, yeah, go ahead, Stefan. Just, just, just a suggestion. If I were to import the XML into my own application or my own database, I would have two options to choose between. One option is to actually combine uh, the uh, metadata and the content directly. That's one option. That's like what I was showing in the uh, JSON example I was showing at the top, where you actually combine directly metadata and content. That's one mm -hmm. option. The other option would be to use the uh, unique identifier, the eRules ID, to actually uh, link instead of instead of uh, using the SGT ID inside my own application. I would use the SDT ID on both the metadata on the and the content uh, to link them together. Yeah, those were two 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 different ways of handling that when you move it into your own uh, environment. Yeah, and and indeed in, indeed as uh, um, uh, another question is is coming. So indeed SDT ID is a pure technical linking mechanism again within one xml file so don't rely on this on it that it will it will be the same in a in a in a new version of a, of a regulation of a, a new xml file it's not guaranteed to to be changed but <clears throat> but inside inside an xml file you can use to connect this uh, uh this two we can um uh, we can discuss more maybe in another session more about um, uh, maybe I don't know techniques to 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 um, to extract and 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 pass, but uh, yeah, this is this is what what uh, I thought is important to to um, um, to, to to emphasize. Um, so the, the the stable one is eRules ID. Yeah, it's it's uh, we we I think we also mentioned in the documentation we 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 recognize that um, this is an important thing that the um, the, the users need to 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 know. Um, all right. Um, so indeed, yeah, we'll, we'll, I'm, I'm sure we'll be talking about that again within, in the new session, maybe in a more technical context, maybe uh, we'll make a, I don't know, maybe a separate session that uh, maybe, uh, uh, you know, uh, targeted to, to uh, developers or people who actually uh, really directly involved in parsing it. Um, so we, we could, could come back to this. Um, Right, then we have another question in slide 10. The, the, uh, I noticed the source title is part of the metadata, indeed. Then we can uh, look at the um, uh, slide 10, Anna. Uh, will a history of metadata also be kept if the title is amended by new regulations? Um, well, um, it, the, the way we store the, the topics in, in our system is in such a way that we maintain uh, uh, history, yeah. So the the the, the history um, of any topic and the metadata is preserved. So we have a uh, we have a versioning mechanism. Now, when we export the, um, the the data, what we at the moment what we export we export a, a snapshot. Yeah. So it's the latest version which is valid yeah so now of course the so meaning that we'll be exporting several snapshots in during the, the time now um we don't export the history directly yeah you can you can um um of course um uh, find this history and if you if you keep a track of all the exports uh, during the time uh, but at the moment, uh, while we do have this history, we, we keep it, we, we track it internally. It's not directly um, um, exported in the file, but you need to, to um, derive it, if, if I may. Now, having said that, of course, we, we all have our uh, 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 plans to maybe at some point to, to issue a, uh, a comparison uh, version, maybe an XML, which is... Um, uh, structure in such a way that it will um, it will offer a um, um, a uh, difference, yeah, a, a diff between between different uh, uh, versions of regulations XML uh, exported, uh, but we still work to we still need to to work on, on on that. So yes, and that's why also such sessions are very important to us to basically hear what the needs of the stakeholders are. If that's the need, please communicate it clearly, 
you can also contact us via the contact us form oh, yeah. because this is we, we use these sessions also to collect the requirements for the next launch because that was the first release now we are trying to see of course there is always a room for improvement and then we want to implement any additional requirements in the next release and maybe this could be one of them okay um my, shall I go to the next question? Please. Yeah. So um, we also have a question about uh, what happens with the ID when a regulation is deleted, especially when it gets valid after two years again, and will it get a new ID or will the ID stay uh, stay the same and it's marked as deleted? Um, first of all, I'm 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 guessing the ID uh, we're talking here is the um, the uh, e rules ID um, that is associated with each topic. Um, and the regulation uh, is in the meaning that a topic, a certain paragraph uh, may disappear at some point, right? Yes, because within some right. amendments, yeah. sometimes paragraphs are deleted. Right, yes. right. Well, well, when it's deleted, of course, when it, uh, it, it will, the topic will disappear. It will disappear from the Disappear, episode. yeah. We're not, as I said, it, it's a snapshot. Now, of course, if you, if you keep in your system, Different uh, you uh, uh, different versions of what you have uh, what you have published, and of course uh, you will be uh, seeing that the the set of topics which is um, included in the new regulation is not the same as the set of topics which was previously. So this is one it gives you immediately you can can make a uh, uh, yeah just to infer that the fact that the topic has been has been removed that has been deleted. Um, so. Um, if it if it uh, occurs later, uh, I don't know. Have you had any uh, cases like this? So, yeah, a certain regulation which uh, uh, surely yes, yeah. yes. Well, yes. well, well it, it may be, yeah. Sure. If it, it happens like that, of course, uh, as I, mess, I said earlier, so we keep a history of those. So, of course, when a, when a topic is is not uh, is it disappears from a published regulation, it doesn't mean that uh, in, in our system is still there, and if. If the same topic, I mean, exactly, it has to be the same unit of data. If, if it if it appears again, it's included again, um, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm emphasizing it. It's the same topic. Then it will be uh, will be preserving the same year ID. Yes, um, but if the topic is deleted as part of the rulemaking action, it will also not be present in the in the export that we share. Yeah, yeah, but the, if if the there will, there will never be any reuse of. A e rules ID yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. only when it's a new version of the same topic. Yeah. Otherwise, it will never be reused again. So, uh, also in your application databases, uh, where it can be important to store uh, older versions of e rules because you might have incidents that actually relate back in time, mm -hmm. um, then uh, it will never be reused. So, it will stay unique. Nothing will ever be given the same yeah. ID again, unless it's a new version, as as uh, Anna and Mario said. Mm -hmm. um, Wait, we have a stakeholder trying to communicate, but we cannot hear it properly. Um, okay, um, then okay. We, um, we have a question, uh, Anna. I need your help here. Um, 2017-373, some GMs are GMs to an AMC. Is it already implemented? This I would need to check precisely and come back. So our process is the following. Uh, E-rules, and there was a question also like that. Uh, E-rules is our easy access rules are not official publications. We are having discussions on business-wise how to solve it. But it doesn't seem to be very easy because of the fact that we are mixing within the easy access rules different types of law. And for instance, the implementing rules, they are published, they belong to the Commission. Uh, that's why it's this disclaimer needs to be there. It's an addition for the time being. It might change. We, we are having discussions, but I, I, I cannot promise here anything. We know that there are complaints coming from the stakeholders or questions on that. For the time being, uh, easy access rules are just like additional publications to help the stakeholders. And the process is the following. 
First, there is an amendment of the official publication, and then, depending on the internal resources, but we, we know that uh, stakeholders are waiting for the updates of the easy access rules, uh, then we, uh, what is the follow-up action is that we quickly update the easy access rules and share them with the stakeholders. About this precise question, I will come back to, uh, to do the stakeholder that asked the question, because I would need to check if the if the GMs are already included. And maybe I will anticipate already a question that was asked uh, below, because there are cases that uh, a new regulation or, GM, uh, or, or decision is already adopted, but the entry into force, the applicability date, come in the future. And the example here was given, for instance, the SMS for Part 21. So for the time being, how we solve it is that, and here again, we need your feedback because we are struggling a bit with the method. So far, the feedback we got from the stakeholders was that indeed, we want those future provisions to be already included in the easy access rules, but please indicate it, mark it somehow that the applicability date is, is in the future. So what we did was the following, we include normally the, uh, those, uh, applic uh, those um, provisions with the future application and we use a special font. In the human readable font it looks like a pink font uh, but in the XML documentation it's described. It has a name of a style and you can, depending on your needs, you can parse it out from your export in case you interested only in the currently applicable or you can leave it and identify it through that special style that was applied to this uh, to those provisions with the future applicability date but here once again we are open to your suggestions we were even brainstorming maybe there should be always two books published the currently applicable book and book containing the uh, the, the, the future provisions we are also brainstorming on improving the information model and to mark those future up, future provisions with a special tags that it's something more stable than a style only. Okay, thank you, Anna. Um, right. Um, yeah, we, we have a, a question about the entry into four states. The, are entry to four states shown in the data? Yes, the, uh, this is part of the metadata that is always amended, that is always updated with the uh, and shared with the with the um, XML that is shared with the stakeholders. Yes. Um, but how? Well, I mean, oh, entry to four state. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you, if you, you yeah. So just just the uh, yeah. So the mm -hmm. metadata. Yeah. The metadata. Yes. So the metadata that is entry always updated thing. is the regulatory source, that is which regulation or decision introduced it, the applicability date of that provision, and the entry into force. Okay. Um, maybe uh, maybe I can be allowed a hypothetical question here. Uh, what is the difference, or how would you explain the difference between applicability date and entry into force date? That's a legal question, but more or less it means that it already was adopted, it entered into force, but you have some time to prepare until it becomes applicable where you really need to comply with it. Where okay. not complying brings consequences. Yeah, so it's fixed in law. But yeah. it's but it may may be in an in between state where it's not actually uh, entered into force yet. Okay. Okay. Um, then uh, Anna, we have a um, a question. Maybe uh, you already touched on when when an amendment was published and is not yet in force. Yeah. So this is we already yeah, answered. Yeah. And the example was exactly SMS. So it's a special font for the time being but we open to any other solution because we're brainstorming also. So please come back to us with your feedback. What would be, what would be the need? Right, um, thanks. Then uh, we have uh, another question. Since 2023, is it possible to take easy access rules as standard or is it still just informative tool? I mean, whether the standard changes, uh, when the standard changes, I'm mirroring in easy access rules just in time, in just in the same time. Yes, so uh, unfortunately, uh, there is still a gap. So we followed the amendments of the official publications. 
Yeah. There is an internal discussion going on, uh, but for the time being, that's still the case. Yeah, and uh, it's, it's a standard. I think it's a, uh, if it's a standard or not. I think it's uh, well, none of us. I mean, it, it, it's, I think it's more like a legal point of view. I mean, yes. the standards are only the commission published, uh, right? Or? For the uh, for the regulations, yeah. yes, that's yeah. the official publication mm. for AMCGM. It's uh, ED decisions, and mm. we are taking the content, consolidate it, and share it with the stakeholders as a supportive material for the time being. Yeah. Um, then we have a question uh, on slide 17. Um, if um, if the format, I'm guessing the format, does it allow also to import uh, easy access rules in MS Access database? Well, I think the answer is is, is yes, but uh, of course you need to 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 um, you know to to parse it in in the way that you uh, it fits your schema in the um, uh, MS Access. Um, I'm not up to date with how much uh, uh, if there's any uh, any um, uh, size uh, blobs or whatever how how the MS Access is can handle big uh, big chunks of text or something like that. If there are any uh, uh, tools uh, already uh, existing that can parse uh, XML, I think. Uh, yeah, I remember uh, talking with somebody who was using uh, SQL to, to to parse the XML, which is uh, also another another way. And so I would yeah, uh, I would uh, recommend doing a transformation. If you go to uh, slide number, let's see, there is another of the slides that actually tries to illustrate this point. Slide twenty. Uh, in slide 20, you sort of have a um, an outline of how you could create database records uh, from the XML with the blob with containing the text that we actually talked about. And as far as I know, uh, access, it would be perfectly possible to transform the export XML into a format that looks like what you have on the screen here where the uh, content blob, there you have uh, the choice of uh, text only, or you can uh, have it as a uh, more sophisticated uh, uh, a version of the content. But at any rate, um, defining records in an access database and doing a transformation of the export XML should make this perfectly possible. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Stefan. Um, right, a lot of uh, eRules XML files are around uh, 30, 40 megabytes, which is really difficult to handle, at least not if, not if you want to take a quick look at the bare XML. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's correct. So it, in, indeed, it, 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 our XML format is, is um, verbose. Yeah, it, it has a lot of formatting, and this stems from the fact that, uh, it, as uh, Stefan mentioned in, uh, in in the presentation, um, we wanted to to be as inclusive as possible. I mean, not 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 strip any data that uh, or, or uh, even there may be formatting that uh, uh, people can actually use it and and, and parse it and extract it. Um, and of course, it's uh, worth the images, and and they are also uh, base64 encoded and uh, in in the same file. Um, on the other hand, it's uh, the file itself. I mean, of course, if you want to just look at the XML, pure XML file, of course, you you need a, a, a good XML editor, as we, we mentioned. Um, no, Notepad. Just opening in Notepad won't won't be uh, uh, an option, of course. Um, I yeah, it's uh, you need to, to use a good XML editor which can 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 see that. But of course, uh, somebody may argue that well, you only need to do this at design time when you when you actually um, um, uh, implement your code to parts it, um, because uh, yeah, that's it's it's intended to be for for machine machine processing. Um, if you if you just want to to look at the content itself, you can open it directly in 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 Word, as it was mentioned, and you can see the content easily. You know, just just to see to have a feeling how the structure is. But it's still a big file. And yeah, it is. A, it's still a big file. Yeah, it, and we, maybe indeed, we yeah. did think about it because it is a recurring feedback from the stakeholders. Yeah. And I saw there was another question 
uh, that maybe we should share two files, one file showing just the structure, another file showing the content so that there is something lighter and something yeah, uh, I'm, um, not ex I'm not a technical expert, but we should definitely brainstorm on that. We uh, we have the we we would always have the option of actually using the map. That's actually the structure file that represents the structure, and then each topic as a file on its own. So you have a package that that's just I'm just mentioning that as a possibility. You could have the map. You could have the individual topics as individual files we'll uh, uh, <laughs> and for a full package. And all of these would then be uh, much, 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 much smaller. Mm. Yeah. And, and since uh, I'm, I'm also keeping, uh, trying to keep a look at what were uh, the, the things that um, um, people are still still um, posting in the chat, I think it's, it, I see a fantastic uh, number of good ideas. And I'm, I'm, I'm really excited that we will be uh, actually uh, will be looking at those and, and see how, how we, we, we shape, shape our, our um, you know, project in the future. Um, but um, I'm just, and I, I'm seeing that um, um, a comment about the development developing a tool chain and I'm not to connect this with this um, uh, remark about the, the big files. Of course, somebody, um, one, one technique would be that um, if, you, if you see that, um, as you, you see, you look at the file the first time, you see that there are certain, certain things that you actually, you know for sure you don't need. For example, like uh, some packages which, uh, 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 you know, you, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm using the word packages, which is exactly the, the, the meaning in the OXML format. So, it's so structures so or parts of the XML that you, you you for sure you don't don't need you're not interested in that. Then the, maybe the easiest thing is just to write a very simple XSLT which just strips everything that uh, you're really not not interested and not you know it's not even very difficult. I mean just uh, uh, just you don't need to re replace just strip it over maybe. Um, and uh, if, if you end up with a valid, uh, another valid XML, but just only the already simplified, then then when you look at that particular file, then it's uh, you, it may be easier to to, to develop your your um, your own um, uh, tool chain. Yeah, and I, I, trust me, I'm, I'm also I've been we've been doing on our, our uh, own work on on parsing it. We uh, we we know the kind of difficulties uh, uh, that is facing, but uh, we also uh, Seeing that, well, they're not, uh, I mean, yeah, it may be look uh, very difficult in the beginning, but as you start working with it, it's, it's, it really, uh, it's, it gets to, to an easier part. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, okay. We know that the format of the file looks uh, complex and uh, it's a bit heavy, but uh, this is a result of uh, various requirements that we have and the fact that we are targeting uh, various types of uh, customers, let's say, stakeholders. Uh, it is possible that uh, you are using using this uh, data with different uh, tasks and different context. So uh, here with the single bullet, we are trying to kill many rabbits. And uh, for that reason, the, the file really is complex here. But it contains really all the possible data and pay attention this is not just a file that you use uh, as a document it, yes you can uh, you can open it with word, with word and uh, print it for example but the idea is here is that this is a complete snapshot of the database with the with the topics there and the first thing that you need to to pay attention is what is exactly the content the content contain the, the content of the file uh, includes, uh, let's say, three major components. The topics, which represent the actual data, but it also contains the metadata, which are additional fields giving you the possibility to organize taxonomies and uh, implement uh, search mechanisms and uh, have the different criteria. But also, there is a, a, a map inside which shows the link between uh, the metadata, uh, between the, the topics themselves and how they are organized in the hierarchy. So, the, the, the good answer here is that um, in order to use this uh, file proper, you need to have uh, some uh, uh, programming uh, uh, tool, like uh, SDK or uh, 
another uh, environment where you, where you need to have a, uh, your own system compatible to to read it means at the moment on the on the internet you can find a number of uh, open source implementation of various libraries which can read and uh, parse the format that means for example if you want to import it in the access database or any other uh, database it will not uh, really happen with the single button click you just uh, open the file and it goes in the in the database uh, you need to to call a, a library opening the file and then proceed the content topic by topic uh, uh, object by object and import it in the respective objects uh, in respective tables or whatever uh, structure you have in your current database this is a bit different than just clicking. yeah i think you're going to have a, uh, a yes, and maybe a question from me on uh, let's see if that's mm -hmm. related because what is also on the agenda of this project is in the future to and we introduce the apis would that be any help to handle yes. the big files so in the in the past i mean a month ago there was a question not just single question many question again again about the the structure of the file uh, why we are not doing it like uh, the FAA. FAA are doing it? Okay, the, the very basic uh, answer is uh, it's related to the finances. I mean, to the the, the budgets that we have here, and uh, um, yes, we have planned to implement the API. That was the first. Where point. the API will will supply the the let's say the different chunks of the documents and they will be accessible in the in programmatic way but at the moment we are not on this stage yes but we are considering this is really on the agenda mm -hmm. to yeah. end to introduce okay. the yes so just uh, that that would be a web service uh for us yeah look I think if you could learn well, from an API. Indeed, yes. I mean, yeah, we need, I mean, we will we'll be looking at all, all, all technical, technical. Yeah. of course, the web service, something yes. like that, or, yeah, of course, yeah. Yes, it's but that's a choice. direction to help the stakeholders handle the big files. It, yeah, it, yeah. If, of course, I mean, I'm, I'm looking. Of course, that's that's also more also for 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 giving the possibility to to get access to the history and to make comparisons. So I think this is probably also an added value for such 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 a web service. For the parsing, I mean, I mean uh, it's it, again uh, as as a programmer myself, it, the first look at it looks it's it, indeed it's it's uh, maybe intimidating. But as you actually, if you if you if you use a, any tool, I did it with Python, just using the XML standard libraries and extracting and constructing the DOM tree and 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 parsing it and extracting the information. It's really I, I'm not lying to you, but. 100 lines of code with, with some additional stru structure, just using the XML uh, um, um, uh, standard library in Python, so not even OXML uh, SDK, it, it, it's possible, it's possible. Of course, as the um, application gets more complicated, of course, it, you, you'll need more, 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 uh, more coding there. If you use the OXML, um, SDK, and if you code in .NET, for example, in, in C Sharp, then you get all objects there, and you can just, just uh, with one line of code, you import the entire file, and then it, it builds your DOM tree, and you can can parse it. You have it has objects. You can can manipulate, remove them, remove whatever you don't need. Uh, tabs, uh, uh, the the um, the um, um, uh, the elements representing types or white spaces, what doesn't interest you, remove them and, and, and uh, keep only the text. So it, it, I, I think it's possible. Um, again, uh, just uh, it needs a bit, bit, uh, bit of um, um, uh, dedication to it. Yeah. Okay, All right, now maybe, yeah, question. just uh, so. Um, which tool do you recommend to navigate open and extract information and metadata from the large XML files without crashing since MS Word is very limited? Um, if somebody mentions uh, oxygen here and uh, also uh, saying that very difficult for the big ones like continuing airworthiness. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, XML tool. I'm, I'm, I've been using, I don't, uh, I heard about oxygen. I haven't used oxygen. I think, Stefan, you're using oxygen. Yes. Uh, so I would mention, if I have to mention, 
I would use, I would mention oxygen and then I would uh, mention X metal mm. as the, as two of the large, well-known XML uh, tools that are available. And on, I'm using, uh, I've been using Notepad++ with a uh, 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 plugin for XML and yeah, that seems to be quite, uh, there's an option there that it seems that you need to check in uh, to, to check that you, it opens large files. And I, I was, uh, Visual it, Studio Code definitely opens uh, this size of files and there yeah. are plugins for OXML which can parse it even you can yeah. do better data. Yeah. And not that plus plus is, is free as far as I know. So, so. Um, but of course, again, I mean, if you're a programmer, of course, you're interested to look at the file. And I'm guessing as a programmer, it might be easier. You, you already have some 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 uh, experience with this kind of tools, um, because otherwise, uh, really, it doesn't make sense if you just if you if you if you intend to 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 copy data from it, the XML itself as opening as a text file. Of course, it's not the right way to do it. Um, and if you want to validate, it's just to, to see if it's correctly formatted. Maybe you 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 have it down, so it's just open in the word. And it's, it gives you immediate uh, feedback that the, the, the file is 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 um, uh, correctly is is correct is is, is valid XML file. So. Um, how you include images in your XML? It seems that you encode it uh, into the binary code. This leads to very partially large XML files. Is there an alternative? Uh, yeah, uh, partially we dis discussed a bit. So, uh, uh, Stefan, uh, the images are uh, base64 encoded. I think we also have a. Uh, uh, this is part of the FAQ. Yeah, this okay. also we have, have a. Uh, yeah, so we have a we have a item in the uh, uh, FAQ, uh, which says about the images. We also give ex give examples how to extract it, and also the uh, other, uh, for example, the formulas. Uh, how to convert it to MathML. I think we, we have that uh, some some examples. So so please please check the FAQs. Uh, uh, hopefully you can uh, can see that. Uh, um. Or Stefan, maybe you want to complement the answer. Uh, yes, it's correct that uh, to keep it all in one file, the binary objects are, are transformed into what is known as. Uh, base 64 runtime encoding or something like that at least and it's uh, it's actually very uh, it's a very small trick to convert them back into their original format whether it be a jpeg file or a png or a, or whatever uh, the original graphic format is it's it's uh, you can search on the internet and figure out how to transform from uh, runtime base 64 encoded to a binary file and you'll find a small uh, small code segment that can actually do this job for you let's move to the next question okay um we have two questions which to me they look like more like a, a legal questions uh, one is about the um, some explanation of a, of a disclaimer and the uh, um, yeah, the one one about the intellectual copyrights rules to be followed, and about the disclaimer. Um, are we able to open uh, to answer this without uh, having a maybe, legal? Maybe let us uh, mm -hmm. consult our legal colleagues, and then we will pose the question uh, as part of the FAQs. Yeah. So and uh, sorry, we're not we're not having a, a legal maybe background we here, and we don't want to give the, the wrong answers uh, here. I hope you understand that. But we will really, we'll be um, will be answering those. Um, Maybe you can even can put it in. again once, uh, once <laughs> yeah. again about the disclaimer. Yes, that unfortunately uh, the easy access rules are still not the official publications. The discussion is ongoing. Maybe it will never come to the point uh, due to the different ownership of, of the different types of law. This is the version to support the stakeholders. Yeah. But we will elaborate a bit, a bit more on that. Right. Um, and another question, which I'm, I'm sure is will open a lot of discussion here, yeah, it's about, um, um, and I, I'm, I'm sure it resonates, and I'm, see, I'm, I'm certain that I've seen other uh, the, uh, questions that uh, in, in it actually uh, are about the same things. So identification, identification of changes. What about identifying changes into a paragraph? Um, well, 
So, we, so far, uh, we, we, we looked at the topic um, as, a, um, as the smallest unit that we, we broke the, contact, uh, the, the, the content into. Yeah? So, this is, so you, you see that we, uh, um, we, we, we broke the uh, content into topics and topics have metadata. So, of course, the question is, what about those, um, um, those uh, items which are in a topic like uh, the, uh, you know, the uh, uh, individual, how the, yeah, yeah, yeah. What about those? So, let's let's say first about the, the changes into it. how do you identify the changes into uh, into a topic yeah well of course um uh, as i said you uh, and i think it was mentioned one easy way is just compare the text you know that uh, again uh, we talk about here about uh, a format which is uh, this uh, is um, intended to be processed by a program and when you process by a program, and if you identify, if you extract the text, including all the elements that you are interested into, you actually, they have value for your application. And this is for you to decide this. Maybe you're not interested in white spaces, or maybe you're not interested in certain content. So you need to, to decide from, from a topic, which is, which are the parts which are of interest to you. And of course, then you, when you have two versions um, of a different regulations and, and each regulation containing maybe uh, different versions of the same topic, you can compare the text uh, between all the two uh, topics. There are, uh, every uh, language has, has, uh, has a lot of uh, uh, libraries, I'm pretty sure, that allows you to do, do easy comparisons, diffs, uh, whatever. Um, and you immediately could see the topics again. And the emph emphasis here is that what are you interested in? You know. Um, having said that, I can uh, just uh, mm -hmm. yeah, just just to confirm that almost uh, for any development tool that I know of, you would be able to uh, import classes for free. Pro, uh, you know, software classes for free that would uh, make it easy to do an XML. Uh, differencing with, with that would give you a meaningful output where that highlights the differences between two XML files. That's that's yeah. a uh, that's a, a very uh, broadly available set of tools and for free. Yeah, yeah. So basically, what I would do, um, for example, I know that uh, when I identify that the topic has been changed based on the um, and on the metadata as we discussed, then if you want to see, okay, what exactly has been changed inside the topic, then of course you need to 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 compare the, your previously stored topic. I'm assuming you stored it somewhere, or and with the text of the new one, and you see exactly uh, uh, what has changed. Um, Yes. Yeah. In the, again, as I said, in the future, we will probably uh, provide also a, a, a sort of a comparison kind of uh, um, that would, comp would would have some some what we think that it's it's the uh, the, the differences. Uh, so this. Yes. Uh, so just uh, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Go ahead. Stefan. Stefan. Maybe, maybe just a, a small comment. Uh, since uh, content is structured into topics. Uh, it's a very different business to find differences than it was than it used to be mm -hmm. when you had a uh, 300 page PDF file and you asked uh, does it contain changes yes it does good luck uh, with your work in front of you to figure out where are the changes in these 300 pages and to figure out what is the impact of this uh, with the new structure it's we have we have uh, given you a few hints on how you can identify what are the change topics so the, these are much much smaller units of information so then you can decide whether you need if you look at the topic we have the emergency exit access 26105 that we have on the screen for example would you need uh, highlighting of differences or would you actually manually have uh, your subject matter experts look at what was in the new rule here so i mean the fact that it's limited to uh, you can you can easily find the topics that are changed 
instead of uh, having to go through 300 pages, you would actually look at 10 lines or 20 lines. That's yeah. a different, very different mm -hmm. uh, job. So just to summarize it from the business perspective, the ident identification of rules paragraph that are changed will be uh, can be done through uh, um, identifying a different value for the regulatory source metadata. So like this, you would fish for potential topics that were changed. And then, like Marius suggested, once we have, for instance, the 10 topics that with, with a different metadata value, we could use the comparison tool to, 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 to see what are the changes uh, done precisely for those topics. And let me use it as an occasion to introduce uh, some uh, new features that are on the horizon of this project. So what we're planning to introduce in the very near future, but we are talking here about the PDF output, would be to always publish two books. One clean version of the easy access rule, and then a version in sort of track changes showing the, uh, showing the changes. But we are talking about here uh, about the, the human, readable, um, human readable format, the PDF. But that could also be a way to somehow compare the changes. Uh, maybe what we can uh, we can use also this um, this question as um, as something to introduce because so far in the export the smallest bit is a topic and we know that there are stakeholders that are using the export to create the check uh, audit checklist and they struggle with getting the data from inside of the topic. For the time being, you can identify that data just based on styles that are inside. But we are planning to enhance a bit the information model, to introduce some tagging so that that information can be retrieved in a more stable way. And once again, your feedback, your suggestions are more than welcome here because uh, we are about to, to start this project. Yeah, yeah, and the, the, that's uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Sana. So yeah, uh, it, as, as Sana mentioned at the moment, if you if you go if you want to parse the topic and you want to identify the paragraphs, um, and I'm I'm referring here that also to a question that uh, the paragraphs uh, um, or observation comment the paragraphs uh, don't have this stable ID is a big problem for granular updates in database. Um, yeah, indeed. So it's um, um, we we plan to to add, um, let's say, our own custom um, information or custom elements inside the content of the topic that would allow you to unambiguously extract those um, um, pieces of, um, of, of a list, you know, if you want, those, those identical paragraphs. If I'm looking at now the, at the screen, all this um, um, A, B, a, B, C, yeah. So now, if you look at now at, the, at this point, if you look at in the XML, then you you're gonna see that you still can parse them. I it, it's done. It, it's it, it can be done. You just look at the uh, 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 you need to identify the um, uh, the styling information that it, it keeps that. But of course, the styling information is not the right way to do it. You, you, of course, you it, you can do it, and it will save you a lot of manual work. It done, uh, but. It's not. We we understand that's not the, the way to 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 do it. So we want to improve that, and we add it um, to in order to add. Uh, and we will add um, um, special tagging that will allow you to allow program to to extract unambiguously those uh, uh, those items and and categorize them. So it's it's the next step. So it's it's we need to 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 uh, to. Uh, you know, to, to work a bit on that to, to actually um, uh, implement such a thing, and you'll, you're going to see how it's worked. But I, I, once again, uh, I'm saying, and I'm, 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 I thank Stefan for, for, for a good point of that. So it's, it's, it's a step, in my opinion, step forward, and I'm, I'm also talking as a, as a user, I mean, somebody who's programming what, what has been done and, and, and knowing how it was in the past and how, you, how you, you can do it now. So it's it's much easier. You can write programs. You can make it uh, uh, much more easier to identify the changes, even the parts at the paragraph level. And uh, yeah, in the future we'll have it this paragraph level um, even more more um, or better or, or 
properly uh, data modeled and 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 uh, exposed to to a, uh, a programming uh, uh, way to to extract. Mm -hmm. um, and I think Vincent wanted to ask a question live. I guess hmm? Vincent, you raised your hand. Thank you very much. Uh, I think it's really a key aspect because basically you do have guidance materials, you do have AMCs that are related to one specific point or sub point within one of the topics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it means that you sh you shall do that because basically this is the structure that is published. And I agree with you that basing everything on styles is probably quite unstable or might be quite difficult to maintain later on. And it it also requires you to plan for a certain set of labels. Let's say there is A within A, there is A1, A2, A3, and yeah, so on. Yeah, exactly. mm -hmm. And as it was stated by George, the, the compliance management is is at the level of the point, topics, subtopics, sub subtopics. So we need to go that. And my message is just, just to please put the highest priority on that. Basically, we do have internally within Eurocontrol already such a database, and this is the level down we went because it's it's mandatory. So my point is really, really high priority. Thank you very much. This is really great yeah. feedback, Vincent, yeah. and we might invite you to <laughs> yeah. to some further discussion because maybe this cooperation could be fruitful. Yeah. between us and the euro control also uh, so that we we see how you went through that project yeah. maybe that could be inspiring for us Indeed. thank yeah, you and we all have our own internal pressure from from our colleagues who are doing auditing and they yes, also yes. have uh, their tools that would like so yeah we 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 very aware of it mm -hmm. so uh, was was somebody was was oh, okay so, so. And, uh, and you also have to uh, uh, maybe again for, for, for people, so we, we started top down here. Yeah? So we, we, we reached the point and I mean, we, we, we have, it was a lot of work to, to, to break down the, what, the, what was unstructured data, to give it some structure, to, to identify metadata and to, 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 um, um, to have the system that we have at the moment. And yes, we now we need to go uh, even even deeper. And we also have to 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 uh, realize that yeah, we also in ASA we also have our, our a class of users which are the the, the writers of the rules. Yeah. So <laughs> this has uh, the, the system. Yeah, yes. exactly. Mm -hmm. So the the system the, the writers of the rules are also um, they are um, the dual rule makers. Yeah, they are interested in seeing the big big picture. Um, also, so uh, yeah, it's uh, this is why we had to take a, 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 a top-down approach, and um, um, yeah, it's uh, we're aware about it. Yeah. Um, regarding the f uh, maybe oh no yeah okay so uh, we have a question here about again about the um, the. Um, the, uh, let's say that. Let me read it. So the e rules could be extremely helpful to ascertain and maintain compliance of service provision with the legal framework. Um, what process is in place to make sure that the content of the e rules is synchronized with the EU legal framework, and especially for the EU 2017373? It seems that the e rules is not always up to date. Um, and this, of course, this poses an issue for the service provider. And uh, can you, as a clarify? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, once again, I need to stress that the official publication and then the EROS production, these are for the time being two, uh, two separate processes. It's, uh, it's due to the fact that the um, official publication, especially when we talk about regulation, they are owned uh, by the Commission. We are having discussions to see how to synchronize, how to integrate these processes. But that's all I can say at, the, at this stage. We know it's an issue. We know, yes, please. Okay, somebody I think is, is unmuted. Uh, we know it's an issue. We know it's an issue, the gap between the official publication uh, and then the update of the easy access rules. We're working on it. We are aware, but for the time being, these are unfortunately two separate processes. Um, okay. Um, 
Uh, regarding the format, um, um, would you provide, does I have a question, uh, not the, regarding the format, would you provide a specific DT, DTD file, if the XML file provided, uh, in order to interpret and manage this XML format in a consistent way? And why not using the ATA standard S1000D format? Um, regarding the, um, the DTD files, um, well, we do, um, yeah, okay, let, let's take, take a step back. So um, the, uh, the, the, the XML file that we published is, is based on OXML. So all the um, DTD or the schema actually, which is the modern way of, of describing the, the um, XML structure. So all the schema and the DTD files which are relevant for the OXML format, I think we, we, we listed the uh, um, uh, in, in our documentation, it's, 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 it's a big, uh, uh, um, uh, big list there. Um, so it, they are public, so it's, uh, you, you can see the documentation on, on, uh, on, the, yeah, on the sites. We also have um, a part which is um, describing the, uh, for example, the, all this structure, all the, this, the map, so the TOC. So we have, a, we have that part which is described in our own schema. And this is also in, in our documentation packages, package. So it's not a DTD, it's a schema. It's a, actually it's very very simple. Um, so it's it's all in the documentation. Um, having said that, uh, it, it depends on your use case. Uh, personally, I, I did parsing of, of the XML file without having to to, um, to rely on on uh, uh, on the schema file but more on the documentation and understanding what the XML elements are. So Stefan, any, any, uh, anything that you want to add on this? Uh, no, not really. Mm -hmm. I think you mentioned uh, everything that's, that's worth mm -hmm. mentioning. So there are uh, the equivalent of DTDs are XML schemas and they are available for all parts of the export XML format. Mm -hmm. Also for the specific he has a namespace, uh, everything that you've seen in the XML, starting with a with a prefix of ER colon, is actually a separate uh, EASA namespace. And this part of the XML is can then be validated by using the uh, schema that's part of the package that was uh, sent out. Um, and regarding the ATA standard S1000D format, I have to admit I'm not familiar with this. Uh, but the, the reasons in general as, answering the question why a certain format, I think uh, uh, Stefan had uh, in, in the presentation a bit of, um, uh, of the uh, reasoning for that. Of course, there are different, um, as uh, somebody may FA using uh, a standard which is for all the uh, American uh, agencies. Uh, uh, has different uh, different things. I mean, another format. It's, it's also an XML, and they also provide some some conversion to JS, JSON. Um, um, then there are other things that could have possibly used, like there's a uh, uh, I think it's a legal XML markup language. Um, yeah, but I, I, I think uh, when when you look at uh, what we could see. Uh, being available um, in 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 the uh, this XML space, I think, and and looking at our own um, own experience, uh, yeah, we ended up with uh, with the way uh, uh, that we have seen it, and we still think that that's the best way for what uh, what we need. But I yeah. think it's a, it's a good suggestion that we look at the uh, S1000D. Absolutely. I know uh, yeah. quite a bit of it, and. And you can get a uh, you can get uh, inspiration for fields to uh, make the uh, XML tagging of the content uh, more precise. You can get some inspiration uh, from that standard as well as other places. Uh, when we go uh, this next step that was discussed on improving the uh, information model of the content. 
Okay, thanks. And yeah, indeed, thanks a lot for 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 mentioning also this uh, this stand results that we need will will be looking at. Um, and I think uh, it's a follow up uh, uh, question. Uh, again, it's a legal state. What about the legal resilience of the ER content, and how should the service provider, for example, ensure compliance? If several months pass between the publication of new IRs or even NGs, so I don't know if uh, um, you want to know. We definitely uh, we are aware of that difficulty. We're working to reduce that gap between the. Unfortunately, that is all I can say at this stage. But we we are more than aware. We get this feedback from the stakeholders. And ideally, that should be one process that uh, that the easy access rule at the same time should be the official publication. I don't know if that's possible. We're having a discussion on on trying to integrate these two processes. We will definitely keep you posted. All right. Um, now uh, I have to say that um, I. Um, from my part, I've seen uh, all, all the all the questions that were asked uh, until the uh, time when we started the questions part. Okay. So, um, but I haven't. Uh, while I was was reading those, I don't, haven't uh, uh, actually looked at the uh, new a lot of new 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 questions. So I don't know if any of Boris, maybe you have you uh, can you can you pick something there. Um, because it's it's a lot. Uh, we it's, yeah. It's, um, uh, yeah. I see many questions. Mm. They're going in uh, maybe two or three categories. Uh, most of them are about the XML format, the, the possibility of creating the API and the various uh, other suggestions. I yes. hear, so API, I definitely, that's on the horizon. This yes. is one of the it's next. Definitely things. on the horizon. We are discussing it. Uh, the technology, of course, we're discussing uh, the technologies which will be behind the API. I see here people are uh, uh, expressing their preferences about the REST-based uh, mm -hmm. API. Yes, uh, that most probably will be our... Uh, yes, and this is great to get this type of feedback. That's that's what, what this session is yeah. also for. Yeah. Yannick, do you have any questions that could be... Mm -hmm. I can, I think I, I, I now I, I managed to, to find the, the place where we, we, where we left. Start? In the meantime, thanks for. Uh, so we, we have a question that says, uh, data is an o, uh, OASIS uh, ISO standard. And uh, the question is, if you have used the data specialization to produce the following namespace, uh, ER, element, topic specialization. Um, uh, uh, Stefan, I think you, you're the best one to, to answer that. Yes, uh, I can say that, first of all, as you may have noted, uh, the map structure, the table of content outline structure that puts together the uh, components, uh, the topic modules, is actually straight ahead uh, from the DITA standard. So in, in that way, the DITA standard is, is behind this. Uh, in an, in uh, the uh, uh, EASA namespace in itself, uh, as you see, the ESA namespace has very, very little uh, except the metadata fields on their own. So there's not much uh, to to pick up from the data standard uh, in for the uh, ESA namespace, actually. So for, for that, the question was no. But uh, we are very aware of and used to work with the data standard, actually. So we, we are very open to places where the principles of the data standard can add value to what we are doing, especially. OK. Um, thanks, Stefan. Um, and going to the next one. So from an authority point of view, it would be interesting to see how the, um, for example, the checklist stemming from the ER could be created. Is there any simple way to transform um, the XML data into an XSLC? XLS, sorry, <laughs> XLS, not XLS. Um, uh, Stefan, we, we we discussed about that even uh, this morning, so maybe you could um, could um, mention that. Uh, uh, yes, the answer it is possible to uh, create uh, such a transformation that could turn it into something that could be opened using Excel. That is possible. 
uh, is it a big job or a small job? If you take uh, someone who's trained in doing this, it. Yeah, I, do, I don't know. I don't want to come up with a guess, but it's certainly less than using uh, thousands of hours uh, every year on doing this manually. Mm -hmm. So again, it can be automated uh, and uh, and that's the that's the good thing. Yeah, whether and, it's and simple it, or not depends on how much training you have in doing it. Yeah, um, and and of course when you talk about checklists, they're going, we we're going back to what we discussed about extracting the paragraphs, and, and yeah, the then the answer is still possible. Yes, of course. Uh, again, you you're relying on style information which is provided by OXML uh, by default. You know, it is um, you know line line I uh, don't don't recall exactly how it's called, but uh, it, the styling information that of course uh, it will be even better when we 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 will be introducing um, our special um, uh, special tagging to to identify those uh, uh, sub paragraphs that make usually make into checklist. Yes, something more stable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, if I can right. take a question, yeah. I see that Jill is writing, please get rid of and and spaces in regulatory refer references. And this is really great feedback. And it comes from the times where the rules, the convention comes from the times where the rules were drafted, uh, only thinking that there will be a human readable output. Now, of course, we have machine readable output and this end it's it's uh, it's something disturbing. So I will definitely pass it on to the editorial team, and they need to start working on changing uh, the convention. It's it's good feedback. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, how many time in advance to the applicable date a change is communicated with a new XML file? Times in advance. It honestly depends on a case by case basis and unfortunately on the availability of the resources. Uh, the process is once an official publication is there, we try to directly follow up and include it in the uh, in the update of the easy access rules. But I would it would be very difficult for me to commit on, on a precise timing. We try to make Sorry, the yes, please. I raised my hand. Uh, Daniela, I, please. Yeah, it, it is exactly the question I have. So mm -hmm. as far as I understood um, until now, there is no given and um, process or procedure stating within a given time frame, you have to have incorporated the content. You have to have um, enough resources. Mm -hmm. uh, you do a quality check on the content or stuff like that, right? Uh, right. For the time being, there is no commitment on the time, but I, I am uh, putting it on my list and I will come back to, uh, I will I will definitely pass it on to the management that if that's the requirement, and I understand that would make sense. For instance, that there is a month, for instance, uh, between the, uh, um, official publication and the update of the easy access rules, so that you stakeholders, you can also plan, you can count on something. Yes. Mm -hmm. Actually, in the in the ideal world, it would be that the easy access uh, version is published before the applicable date because our customers yeah. they want to prepare. Yeah. So the operator want to prepare uh, the upcoming changes and stuff like yeah. that. Mm -hmm. uh, that is very difficult due to the process that we also get the final text from the commission only either at the moment of the publication or really sometimes they work. Sometimes we get it a few days before uh, mm -hmm. the text being published in the official journal, but there can always be a last minute changes. So, mm -hmm. But I think uh, if you align those two processes, it. Uh, it would uh, create <laughs> a really added value mm -hmm. for all stakeholders because if those processes are aligned in the future, um, that should be the best case for everyone in here. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great feedback. All right. Um, uh, there, will there be answers to questions sent in before the session as well? Yes. The answer is definitely yes. There will be answers to questions. Uh, if you have, if you sent us questions uh, 
before the session, you're going to get it. We, we are quick to respond. Um, also, the, as it was mentioned at the beginning, um, we also will be answering also the questions which will be raised after this session, the one that remains unanswered. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll be um, answering every question. Eh? So it's, uh, um, when, when we find some errors in the style definition, for example, how shall we report it? Um, as for any other question, um, we, we have a um, form on the website. The moment is quite simple. Uh, it allows you to attach uh, also uh, awesome. things. So. Yes, Yannick, do you want to share it? I will share the mm -hmm. link. Uh, yes. Maybe that's also a good point because um, we, we it like what we five minutes to, to twelve, mm -hmm. and then it's it's good to, to everybody to see that we also have a form on the web uh, website that can be used for for submitting questions. Yes, yeah. and Yannick just shared it um, in the chat. Yeah. Please use whenever there is anything that you want to communicate. It goes directly to the EROS team that we dis uh, later on we distribute it. If that's something more technical, but it really reaches us. Okay. Um, when opening the XML file, I find a very complex way to manage simple sentences of requirement content. Uh, and there's a uh, there's an example here. Yes, that's that's correct. This is the uh, this is the OXML um, way of of tagging things. And of course, you you can you you it it captures as we mentioned earlier, it captures everything. And um, for example, the the links the the links are. Uh, actually, uh, references stored in somewhere, and there's a, uh, uh, as I say, the um, uh, reference uh, way of getting to those uh, actual values. Um, it's, again, it sounds complicated at the first first uh, uh, side, but it is the way the the OXML standard is is defined, and it's comprehensive. Yeah, if we if we eventually if we had to, had to do something that. Um, ourselves and we probably have hit the same things that the, the, the creators of the XML have have hit uh, you know uh, what is the uh, for example you, you see here it's uh, you have um, things like um, uh, elements WT uh, w uh, uh, column t it's it's just a text file I mean, if you if you if you look at the um, uh, uh, OXML specification, it's it's actually really simple to 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 see how to remove that. I mean, again, uh, it's it's XML. Yeah, there there are um, 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 there are tags. Uh, an XSLT transformation before you you do any other parsing could be just just helpful. You just remove the uh, the um, um, the uh, the elements that you're actually not interested into. Um, in, in other words, it's, it is uh, surprisingly easy to simplify the content. Yeah. And, and tr trust me, I mean, I mean uh, Stephanie is, uh, is, is, is an expert in it. I wasn't an expert until some time ago. And, and the first time when I looked, I said, hmm, oh, well, is it this? But then I start actually um, uh, reading, reading the documentation, reading the specification, trying to, to, to get my, my hands dirty with, with Doing some some programming and it's it's, it's surprisingly uh, surprisingly easy. Yeah. But but on the other hand, of course, we have a understanding for those of you who are asking if we could do this supposedly simple task. <laughs> That's very understandable. Uh, unfortunately, the timing of mm -hmm. this session is coming to an end. Uh, I would like to advertise the following, or we let Yannick advertise it. How to stay informed about any updates. So if you go to the event page, I will share the link later on. You can uh, follow the, this event and then you will be receive an email whenever we publish the presentation or the recordings. Not to miss anything, yes. So what we plan immediately is to make this presentation available with you. Uh, we will then save all the questions received, already answered, and those that were not answered yet. We will update the FAQs. This might take a moment. Uh, then we will publish a date of the new event. We see that really that it's, it's a very interesting and needed topic. 
Uh, so it should not be, I, I think uh, the latest day will be in one month, but maybe it will even be shorter. So please follow the event page so that you are informed. We will brainstorm on the format of the next meeting because maybe it does not make sense to repeat the introduction. Maybe it makes sense to go deeper into, into questions. Let's, let's see. The recording of the session will also be made available. We need to just uh, do some fine tuning on it. And uh, maybe last thing that uh, I would like to advertise is we are always looking for volunteers to uh, volunteers to participate in the testing of the new features. And also we're looking for volunteers to guide us what is needed by the stakeholders. If you feel like volunteering, please use the contact uh, us form to also indicate this availability. I will also place my email in the chat that you can contact me uh, that you can contact me directly as an eRules uh, project manager uh, because we try to be as much stakeholder driven as possible and that was always uh, the strength of this pro uh, of this of this project that we really want to listen to what you need and we want to respond to the needs um, thank you very much for your participation. Thank you very much for all the questions. It's really, it's great feedback for us. We will definitely use it uh, for, the, for the next development. Please stay in touch with us, be informed about the next event, uh, and hopefully see you next time at the next session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.